Great Lakes Prepping here. In today's video, we're making beer brats, 100% from scratch, using the most beautiful cut of pork, wonderful seasonings, and some nice dark beer. This is the third video in my unofficial sausage making series. I did breakfast sausage links, Italian sausage links, and now we're doing bratwurst. This is an absolutely delicious recipe, and I really recommend that if you're into sausage making, or even if you've never tried it before, try this recipe. Now, as with the previous two sausage making videos that I did, this is gonna be using uh, all pork. That being said, you can absolutely use venison or other game meat in this recipe. The only difference is, instead of 100% pork, you go 50% pork and 50% venison, or whatever you have to work with. For this batch, I'm using a 10 pound pork butt so we're gonna get a whole lot of sausages out of that and the recipe will reflect the amount of meat that we're working with. And I guess let's just jump right into it and look at our uh, cut of meat. All right, here's our cut of meat that we're gonna be using to make the sausage. This is what's known as a pork butt, which is also called a pork shoulder. Now I'll mention that while this is a, a really good piece of meat to use for these sausages, if you wanted to do venison sausage or any other kind of game meat, what you do is mix that game meat 50% with 50% pork. And you could use this same exact cut of pork. But since deer and other game meat tends to be so lean, when I do that, I actually go to the butcher and tell them to give me some pork trimmings. They're a bit fattier than the pork shoulder, and that works really well with that super lean game meat. The trimmings are also a bit cheaper than buying the pork shoulder like this, so it works out pretty well. Now, since I'm just doing all pork sausages, I'm gonna use the pork shoulder, and that's gonna work out really well. It's got a good fat ratio. So the first thing I need to do is cut this thing into strips that are narrow enough to fit into my meat grinder. So I'm gonna get started doing that, and uh, we'll fast forward a bit through this because it takes uh, a little while to break this all down and then we'll move on to grinding. All right, pork's cut up into strips and now it's time to grind. Now I'll say that there's a lot of different kinds of meat grinders. There's manual ones, there's standalone electric ones. The one I use is a KitchenAid mixer attachment and for these purposes it works pretty well. I don't grind a ton of meat in an average year, so it's good enough. I will say that uh, as I've gotten more and more into making my own uh, meat products, I think I need to upgrade to, to a bigger one, but for this, it'll work all right to run these strips of pork through. I only gotta put them through one time, and I'm using the medium coarse grinding plate. So I'll go ahead and get all these uh, strips of pork ground up, and then we'll move on. All right, we've got our meat all ground up and now it's time to season it. And since I'm using 10 pounds of meat, I've got my uh, seasonings here all uh, measured out accordingly. 
And as always, I'll have the uh, the recipe and all the proportions and everything in a, in a link in the description here. But for 10 pounds, uh, we have four tablespoons of kosher salt, six teaspoons black pepper, four teaspoons brown sugar, uh, four teaspoons dry mustard, two teaspoons ground nutmeg, two teaspoons dried sage, three teaspoons garlic powder, one teaspoon onion powder, and one cup of dark beer. Now as far as what kind of beer to use for this, uh, really any darker beer is going to be pretty good. I like to use something like a porter, uh, so I'm going to use my uh, Bell's Brewery uh, porter here, and for 10 pounds we need one cup of this. So we got these all measured out, but before adding them to the meat, I like to mix them all together and uh, stir them real well so they're all incorporated, make it a little easier to mix in to the meat. Well, I don't have a, uh, a container that's quite big enough to do this the way that I think uh, would be best. So as usual, I'll just kind of do the best I can. Uh, I'll probably start with about half of this meat in this great big bowl and uh, just start adding the seasoning and kind of mix it together as we go. Now we want to make sure it's completely mixed into the meat, but we also don't want to overwork the meat more than we have to. Okay, and when we got the spice sort of mixed in, I'm gonna start adding in the beer. Now every sausage that you make will end up having some kind of liquid, be it water, some people use milk. For this recipe, it calls for beer, so that's gonna be our liquid. Yeah, maybe one of these days I'll get one of those great big uh, stainless steel meat mixing contraptions and uh, make things a little bit easier, I guess. I'll tell you, as cold as this meat is, my fingers are already about numb from doing this, but it really is sort of the quickest and most effective way to mix this meat together unless you have one of those machines. All right, I think that's pretty good right there. So we're gonna get our sausage stuffing machine set up and we're gonna move on to making some sausages. All right, let me give you a quick overview of the sausage stuffing machine. It's very simple. Basically, we've got this heavy duty frame, the stainless steel uh, cylinder here. We're gonna fill this with all of our ground meat, put it into the, uh, put it into the machine here. And then as we crank this handle down, it kind of pushes this plunger down, the meat comes out the tube, fills up our sausage casings. So let's talk about the casings a little bit. Now, a lot of people buy prepackaged natural casings. That's what we're using for this is natural casings rather than say the collagen casings. Natural casings work best for something like a bratwurst. Now, I tried uh, on more than one occasion using the prepackaged casings. They come in sort of a uh, uh, airtight container and they're all dried out and they're packed in salt and you have to re sort of uh, rehydrate them, soak them in water and then uh, run water through every single one of them to kind of clear any salt out that's in there and it, it's a real hassle and, and, and the part that I liked the least about using them is the lengths they came in were just all sorts of various sporadic lengths. Some of them were quite short. So these days I go to the butcher and just say, I need some sausage casings. They say, how many feet do you want? And, uh, and the pieces they give me are very long. Sometimes they'll give me one great big, you know, 20 foot long piece. And they, uh, you know, they, they give them to me in these little, uh, little just tubs like they would kind of put any kind of thing in, potato salad or anything, charge me a couple bucks and they're good for a few days uh, or more. I don't know, I always use them within the first couple days of having them. I don't have to do anything to them. I just load them up on the machine and they're ready to go. So that's pretty much it. We're gonna get started filling this thing up with some ground meat and uh, getting some casings loaded up on the machine. All right, this is considered a five pound vertical sausage stuffer, which means it'll hold five pounds of meat. I have 10 pounds of meat, so that means 
Halfway through, I'm gonna have to stop, take this back out, fill it up with the rest of the meat. All right, I always like to spritz the uh, the tube here with just a little bit of non-stick non uh, cooking spray. It helps the casings go on the tube just a little bit easier. Now that I finally found the end, I need to just sort of feed it over the, the end here. And it takes a little bit of practice to get the feel down for loading these on. If it feels like it wants to snag, just try kind of moving the end here on the left just a little bit and it'll start sliding again. Now I could have used one of the thicker stuffer tubes that came with my machine, uh, but I'm pretty comfortable working with the narrower one here. I know that it's narrower than the, the sausage ends up being, but that's just uh, that's just what I usually use and I'm pretty happy with the results. So I'm gonna load as much of this casing on the tube as I can. That way I don't have to stop, tie it off, get a new casing going. The more you can put on here, the better. All right, that was one really long piece of casing, and that's awesome. I was able to load a ton of it up onto this tube. What I need to do is tie this off, but I'm gonna let the meat just start to come out so it can push some of this air out. So the meat's just at the tip here, so I'm gonna tie this off. Just a simple knot. That's it. Now the last thing that I'll show you before we start just cooking here is my little tool. This is called a sausage pricker. And this is kind of used for two things. One, as I go, there will inevitably be a little bit of air that starts to fill up the tubes and we're gonna end up with an air pocket. We gotta poke the edge of the, uh, the casing just a little bit to let that air escape. Otherwise, we're gonna end up with big bubbles and we just don't want that. And the other thing we do with this is once the sausages are all made, we give each one of them just a little tiny poke and that'll A, let any remaining air bubbles kind of work themselves out, but also uh, it helps the sausages not want to split or burst when you cook them later on. And the holes are so small that meat doesn't really leak out of them or ooze or anything like that, but it really makes a big difference in uh, both getting rid of those air bubbles and making sure it doesn't split when you're cooking. So now we're just gonna start cranking away and filling up these casings with meat. And you can see right away I've, st I've got some air, some air bubbles that I, I'm not gonna want in there. So almost right away I'm gonna have to give this thing just a little poke, just somewhere near the air, air bubbles so it can escape. Now it's important not to overfill your sausages. If you fill them too snug, then you risk them splitting when you start twisting them into links or when you cook them. This first one's a little lopsided, but we can even that out. So as we go, we'll do our best to kind of roll this up just to kind of keep it from taking up this entire counter.
All right, so I'm at the bottom of the cylinder. That means I need to wind this uh, plunger back up and fill this thing up with more meat. And since I still have so much casing left on here, I don't think that I need to cut this and tie it off. I'm gonna end up with just one absolutely huge spiral of sausage here. So I'm gonna get my hands cleaned up and uh, fill this thing back up with meat and we're gonna go again. Okay, here we are at the end of our meat. That was pretty awesome that I only needed to uh, load up the tube with casings one time. So what I'm gonna do here is pull a little excess casing off of the tube so I can have plenty of room to tie it. Snip it off there. Just tie another little knot. That's it, look at that giant spiral of sausage right there. That is fantastic. That came out pretty well. I didn't really have too many snags, just a couple little air bubbles here and there. Nothing the sausage pricker can't take care of. So I'm ready to kind of lay this out and uh, start twisting it into links. Okay, since we're working with such a big spiral of sausage here, uh, what I'm going to end up having to do is kind of uh, unravel it, twist my links, and then re-roll it up. And I'm basically going to have a sort of reel-to-reel -reel, uh, tape recorder thing going on here by the end of it. So I'm going to start by kind of just unraveling a little bit here. And what I want to do, twist a link about, well, about as long as you'd expect a bratwurst link to be. Maybe about something like that. And since I can't pick this entire spiral up and twist it, I need to do it in a way that doesn't untwist each of my previous twists. So the way we do that is kind of skip one, figure out about where we want it, and we're going to twist this. And before we do so, we want to gently pinch and kind of squish the meat out of the way of where we're going to twist it, because if we don't, we're at higher risk of splitting. And this is another reason why you don't want to overfill them because you're going to make them a little tighter. Each link's going to get a little more tight when you do that pinch. So I'm going to start by twisting this one forward about three times. And then we're going to move down, unravel a little bit more, measure about two links. We'll, we'll say about that. Gently squeeze the meat out of the way. And these links are a little bit overfilled, so I'm really hoping I don't bust one of them. So we twisted the first link forward, we're going to twist this one backward. Three times. Alright, and then we're just going to keep repeating that. Unravel a little more. And there we have it. They're all linked up. Now there's a couple more things that I have to do with these. I mentioned that the sausage pricker comes into play to make sure that they don't split when they're cooking. And what we're gonna do now is give, give each link just one or two little stabs with this thing all the way around. Just a couple of little shallow stabs. Now normally what I do next is lay these out on cookie sheets so I can put them in the freezer for a little while. I like to freeze them for a bit so they get hardened up and then I can vacuum seal them in my food saver bags. That way if they're a little bit frozen 
the suction of the food saver bags won't completely squish and mangle them. Uh, but ordinarily I end up with two or three sort of sections of links. This thing right here is far too big to put on any one of my cookie sheets. And uh, I don't think it would fit just, uh, just in that form into the freezer anyway. So I normally like to wait until they're a bit frozen before I cut them because after you let them sort of sit for a while and start to freeze just a little bit, these, these twists seem a little more durable. And they're a little less likely to kind of uh, unravel when you cut and uh, you, know, you risk some meat leaking out. That usually doesn't happen, but it does happen once in a while. But uh, because I'm gonna need to separate these up a bit before I put them uh, into any of my freezers, I'm gonna have to cut some of the links now. So I'm gonna do that and then kind of see how I can arrange them out on the, on the sheets to put in the freezer. There we have it. You know, I decided to just go ahead and cut the links up right now so I could fit them all on here. And uh, I, I didn't think to show that part of it, but you can use a very, very sharp knife or a good set of kitchen shears and just make sure to cut it right in the center of that twist and they'll come right apart. And I didn't uh, mess up a single one of them, so no meat started leaking out the end. And uh, all in all, I'm really happy with how this went. You know, the, the more years that I do this, the, the less screw-ups I have, which I guess is the way everything goes. It used to be where I'd get one, two, maybe three splits per batch of sausage. And the last couple I've made, I haven't had a single uh, breach of the casing. And uh, I'm really happy about that. So... I'm going to go ahead and get these cookie sheets into the freezers and uh, let them harden up probably, I don't know, um, four, five, six hours, something like that. Uh, if, if, if I leave them in there longer, that won't hurt anything either. Uh, of course, I am going to put a couple of these aside and have them for dinner tonight. And, uh, and I guess I'll show, show the final product of that at the end of this video as well. Well, the brats are out of the freezer and now they're ready to vacuum seal. I'll do these just like I vacuum seal anything. I'll put a couple in each vacuum seal bag, seal them up, mark them with the date, and stick them back in the freezer. So my favorite way to cook bratwurst is actually baking them and then searing them a little bit in a skillet. Now obviously brats are great on a grill, but if I'm not grilling, I find it just a lot easier and more consistent to, to bake them first and then throw them in a skillet. You can cook, cook them totally in the skillet if you want, but you got to kind of go uh, low and slow and make sure that you don't start burning the outside before the inside is cooked. But baking them first and then just getting that nice sort of sear on the outside after the fact works really well. So that's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to bake these in an oven heated to 350 degrees for about 25 minutes. And halfway through that, I'm going to turn them over once. All right, we got the sausages out of the oven. Now we're going to put them into a very hot skillet. Just until we can brown up these outsides a little bit. And that's it, just a couple minutes on each side in that skillet on high heat. Get a little bit more brown to them. And I could have gone a little longer, but I like the way they look right now. And that's it, serve them however you like, on a bun with your peppers and onions, or just slice them up. Me, tonight, I'm gonna go real simple just to give these a taste test. I'm gonna slice them up and eat them with a fork. It's not even a matter of bragging or arrogance or ego when I say that that's the best bratwurst I've ever tasted. There's just no way around the fact that absolutely fresh food is going to taste better. And the recipe that I use is just, just terrific. That is just so savory and tasty. It's exactly what I want out of a, a beer brat. That's just so good. And I'm glad I have about 27 more of them after this to eat. If you've ever wanted to try doing sausage making at home, this is a great recipe to start with. 
yeah, there's a lot of steps, but no individual step is that hard to do. You just need to have good ingredients, seasonings, and a nice dark beer. And I really recommend using a decent sausage stuffing machine. It doesn't have to be huge. They make ones that are much smaller than the one I have. I do, however, recommend that you don't try to use one of those sausage attachments for a meat grinder up to and including the KitchenAid meat grinder. They don't work well. They're trying to use a corkscrew to force meat into a tiny little tube and it just doesn't work well. You need to have a machine that forces the meat down and out of the tube. But anyway, that's the video. I hope you liked it. It's homemade sausage making. It's not that hard and it's just so worth it if you have the time to do it. So if you liked this video, click the subscribe button and stay up to date on all of our latest stuff. And check out the previous sausage making videos where I show how to make breakfast sausage links from scratch and Italian sausage completely from scratch. So that's all for now. Thanks for watching. And until next time, this is Great Lakes Prepping.